Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the part 3 of module 1. We call this part language meaning and reality. Before we move ahead, let us have a quick recap on the two parts that we have already uh, completed, two different trajectories in history that we have already looked at. Uh, part 1 basically traced the history of the studies on the nature of human thought as it has taken place over centuries. Here we looked at how the working of the human brain, human mind has always intrigued scholars across centuries, across space and time and how it all started, what are the different trajectories it took, what are the different uh, standpoints in different uh, times of uh, history and so on. So, starting with the ancients till the modern time, we have charted the history in terms of important landmarks and important scholars that have been uh, that have given us various uh, new insights into this discipline, which helps us understand as the field is today. Part 2 looked at the relationship between brain and cognition and the developmental trajectories that have taken that the field has um, seen in these two, in these two um, different domains of uh, research. Now, it is very, uh, it is not probably entirely correct to say that these two disciplines have been separate. From the very beginning, the idea of mind, the idea of thought and the idea of brain and language have been intertwined with each other in different degrees depending on the time, depending on the, on the uh, particular uh, scholar we are talking about, particular given philosophical thought at that point, but they have remained connected through history and this is what we have seen till now. We have also looked at the role of language in all of these, how language was seen uh, from starting from the ancient time till the cognitive revolution and up to the modern time. As to what role does language play, is it an important tool or is it just a mirror that helps us reflect the events, the facts, the truth of the world into the human mind and so on. We have also talked about some of the debates, some of the uh, controversies surrounding these ideas and how there have been primarily two different camps in terms of the nature of thought and in terms of how language fits into this, whether language is entirely symbolic or it is uh, embodied, embodied understanding of language uh, which is um, quite uh, well, well um, taken these days also traces its roots to the uh, ancient times, the ideas, the debates have always been there. So, after looking at these issues from philosophical and neuroscientific uh, points of view, um, of course, in very brief, now let us move on to looking at this from a linguistics point of view, because this course is primarily a language uh, course, linguistics course that looks at language from the perspective of cognition. So, a historical overview about how the field of linguistics itself has developed and what have been the primary, um, uh, primary uh, preoccupations of linguists over time and what are the primary, uh, what are the main uh, theoretical standpoints and how things have, how, how theories and, and uh, their uses have changed over time and what are the main uh, debates. This is what we will look in, uh, into in this section. So, this is a road map. Uh, language from linguistics point of view and where we will discuss some very important milestones in linguistics. 
because this is only a part in the introductory module, we will not get into all the, it will not be possible to get into all the um, major um, events that have happened, but we will try and cover as much as uh, possible and as much as is relevant for this uh, course uh, to give you an idea about the background in which um, we place this entire course. And then we will move on to how meaning has been dealt with in the uh, in this in this um, field in the field of linguistics and then move on to meaning and reality and the relationship of language. So, to start with uh, language from the linguistics perspective that is there are some sobering thoughts. Initially it was thought that only humans are capable of language, only humans speak so to say. However, there are some very sobering discoveries in of late, there have been studies, ongoing studies the, uh, on animal, uh, in the animal kingdom, their communication system, various kinds of signals that various animals are uh, putting into use for various purposes. We are yet to know the entire uh, scenario, we are in yet to know the entire truth in this, in this um, domain yet, but what we do know is that certain animals, certain certain um, members of the species, various species like bees, whales, zebra finch and so on have very complex signal system among themselves among uh, to be used within the community for various purposes and the complexity of which we are only beginning to understand. For example, zebra finch have been found to actually literally learn to sing. In the initial stages, the baby zebra finch just babbles like human babies and it is uh, unstructured apparently and over a period of time noticing the adult zebra finch, um, they learn how to sing uh, as far as the, the pattern in the uh, community goes. So, there are all these interesting findings. Recently, quite recently in fact, a very similar discovery was made about prairie dogs as well. Now, prairie dogs are a very intelligent, uh, a very intelligent uh, species apparently in terms of language use. They use a variety of squeaks, seeps, chatters, chitters and so on, various kinds of different calls and research shows that these calls are not just some sounds that arbitrary sounds that they are making. In fact, there is a structure to it, there is a purpose to it and there is an usage, um, you know, almost like a speech act uh, quality to it. So, but depending on the uh, need of the hour, they will be using different kinds of uh, chitters. For example, to warn of approaching predators that caused, uh, they will have, they will create, they will use some uh, one kind of chitter and which will eventually uh, as a result of which there will be defensive and evasive actions in the colony. So, the one, one or two or few members will warn the rest of the community to uh, take a defensive position or to hide or you know uh, various actions that are necessary at that given point of time. In fact, acoustic analysis shows that individual differences do not actually exist, what the differences that actually come out is dependent on the kind of stimulus that they have. So, different kinds of stimulus uh, would elicit different kinds of uh, calls, which is which means it is very structured, it has a it has its own structure which is understood by all members of the community. Faced with humans, when humans approach their colonies, they have, also, they have a distinct set of calls which are different from other kinds of calls. So, that is as, as refined as it goes. Of course, um, there are uh, finer details into this if one is interested, um, I will add the reference at the end. It is a very fascinating study. So, this kind of findings, this kind of uh, different findings with respect to the different signal systems, however complex they are, ultimately lead, have led researchers to make a judgment on the basis of um, their use. The kind of, uh, the, there is a, an amount of agreement that even when these animals are um, capable of using signals for various kinds of purposes, it is still dependent on the current scenario, dependent on the events that are unfolding in real time here and now. So, they can dependent on the kind of predators they see, they can warn their members, group members to run away or to you know um, uh, to, to, to be defensive and so on and so forth. So, this is, an, this is entirely dependent on the immediate environment 
whatever is happening in the immediate environment, they can in some sense talk about it. As a result of which, many believe, many presume that animals suffer from some kind of an imprisonment, cognitive imprisonment so to say in the present. So, they are capable of of course, communicating about various, um, uh, various uh, uh, threat perceptions and so on. However, that is refer that is restricted to the current environment, immediate present. Well, that is as far as our current knowledge goes, we really do not know. It is quite possible that after uh, more research we will get to know, we will be uh, better in a better position to uh, talk about this, but at present this is the presumption. So, there is a difference between human language and the language like communication system in various animal um, species that we find. So, humans on the other hand, what is the main difference? Humans on the other hand have used language uh, um, to set us free from this imprisonment. Language actually helps humans to talk about the present, the past, the future, you know to make judgments, to deliberate on actions, to talk about the universe as we have already seen. We have already seen that language used by humans has been has made us capable of talking about the cosmos to the atom and you know beyond. So, to start with we, we believe that language can be a thought uh, a vehicle of the of thought itself and one can talk about past, present, future and so on and so forth. Another interesting aspect of human language is of course, the intentionality as um, intentionality as a part of language and we talk about we use language to talk about the world outside of us. It also creates a social world for humans. Of course, we can we can argue that animals capable of using signals also create a social world, but probably it is um, as of now as of now that is we still believe that our social world creation of the social world is far more complex and multi layered as opposed to other animal species. So, we, we know we create knowledge of the world like science and mathematics as well as abstract domains transmissible. So, we can use language to talk about mathematics, we can talk about language uh, use language to talk about art, culture, history, architecture and so on and so forth. We can use language to transmit that knowledge from um, one person to another, one community to another, from one time to another and uh, basically across time and space and people. So, that sets us um, apart from other, um, other species as to what are the purposes of language, how do we use language and what is the, uh, what is one unique feature of human language. So, so far what we have, whatever we have seen in terms of philosophy and neuroscience of uh, language and various schools of thought, we can uh, safely say that there are primarily two ways of looking at language. If we ask what is language, there are of course, there are uh, there are subtle nuances here and there, but largely we can say that on the one side we look at language as a structured set of forms and manipulation of abstract symbols. So, there are symbols which are arbitrary of course, and then those symbols are manipulated in terms of certain rules and that that is what makes language something somewhat like a computer function somewhat because it is ultimately a symbol manipulation system. That is one. Uh, part of the story. On the other hand, there is a uh, uh, equally dominant school of thought that says language is predominantly a process which is devoted to conceptualization and communication of meaning, because ultimately language helps us communicate and communication is heavily dependent upon the meaning. There is no point talking if you do not mean anything by your sentences. So, and how do we arrive at that meaning? That is a process in itself. The process of conceptualization and transmission of that conceptualization is what language is all about. So, these are roughly the two ways of uh, looking at it or maybe we can say as we will uh, uh, see towards the end, maybe these are two sides of the same story. In the previous parts as we have already uh, discussed, we have already looked at the historical aspects of language related studies from different perspectives, not in terms of linguistics as a, as a discipline. In modern times around the time of uh, cognitive revolution, the nature of language of course, underwent a lot of debate as we have seen that symbolic cognition on the one hand thinks language is purely a symbol manipulating system. Whereas, on the other hand, the embodied cognition approach takes a different, uh, different uh, stand on this matter. 
So, now let us look at the um, story from a historical perspective of linguistics as a discipline. We will start with Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, because not because he was the first to study languages, but uh, in many ways he is considered the uh, first linguist of the modern era. Of course, we can go back in time and talk about Panini in India and other scholars in the uh, in other places, but uh, let us start with the modern era other, uh, in order to understand how in, in the modern time how linguistics as a discipline have flourished. So, Ferdinand de Saussure worked in the uh, late 19th century early 20th century. He is credited with the with bringing in new changes with bringing in changes into the study of language itself. Before Ferdinand de Saussure it is important to remember that this was a time after the colonial period or it, the colonial period was still going on. So, during the colonial period there were new languages, new worlds as they as they are called were found, new languages, new communities um, came to light, uh, western western um, European uh, um, voyages they, they went and found new countries, new languages, new people that naturally gave rise to a lot of um, uh, debates as to how these languages are different from the languages that they spoke for example, English, uh, Spanish or Dutch or Portuguese and so on the dominant languages of the world of that time dominant colonial powers of the time. So, there was a lot of activity in terms of trying to understand language in terms of culture and more often than not it took a, um, a slightly um, there was a there was a hierarchy that was uh, put in place that certain languages that they did not understand were somehow um, not at par with the European languages and so on. But overall um, language anthropological linguistics um, basically started from these endeavors and slightly before that as we all probably as you all probably know that William Jones uh, work on the on Sanskrit and how this um, actually unleashed a lot of work in historical linguistics trying to find out the uh, how languages changed over time, how uh, you know the uh, creating the proto language, formulating the proto languages, how the language families came into being a lot of work lot of um, very important work uh, took place around that time. So, our 18th, uh, 18th and 19th century was primarily devoted to understanding the history of languages, how languages uh, different kinds of languages came into being, what are the historical connection between them, how the changes took place, how, how the sounds changed over a period of time, time as well as space and so on. So, these were the focus of uh, language studies at that time at uh, before Saussure. They were studying language not to understand language itself as in at, at a given point of time, but they are looking at the historical processes that has been at work since time immemorial as to what language came out of what, which are the sister languages, which is the mother language and so on. In that light Saussure becomes very, very important figure for us, because he was the person who said that we can study language for its own sake. We do not really uh, even if we do not look at the history of it, even if we do not look at the uh, not sound change across languages and so on, even then it does make sense. So, that is what um, basically he did, he ushered in the idea of studying language for itself, not to understand history, not to understand anything else beyond language, but just to understand language itself, how the structure works, what are the finer nuances within a language and so on. His major contributions are of course, these two though he was a scholar um, uh, a very important scholar and it is not possible to uh, limit him only to couple of things, but for the brevity of space we will have to do that. So, we will stick to his two major contributions which is the difference between synchronic and diachronic linguistics and his contribution in terms of lung and parole. So, synchronic versus diachronic linguistics um, was a very, very significant um, aspect of his contribution as we have just mentioned that the comparative philologist before him contributed towards understanding and knowledge about the historical development of languages. Right. So, they were looking at if Sanskrit is the mother language, what are the daughter languages, what are the sister languages and how languages spread across continents and what are the differences, what are the similarities and how sound changed and so on. This was the background. Saussure brought in the assertion that 
the studying contemporary languages was equally important. It is not only important to understand the history, but looking at languages as it is right now is also um, important. That is how he proposed this two way difference. Saussure was very fond of um, giving analogy of chase to make his argument in terms of language. So, he does this with this as well with this um, case of synchronic versus diachronic linguistics. Now, diachronic let us make the uh, let us define what it is. Diachronic linguistics basically refers to understanding language, studying language across time. So, the historical aspects of it, how languages came into uh, the current uh, shape, how it came to the current structure, how it got the current sound system and so on. So, across time studying language across time is diachronic linguistics. Synchronic on the other hand studying the language as structure as it is at a particular given point of time, time remains fixed. So, you look at language right now. So, he gives an example, uh, he gives an analogy through the game of chess in this case. He says just in the game of chess the arrangement of the board is constantly changing. We are all if we were, if it is a if it is a game in progress the arrangement of the pieces chess pieces on the board constantly changes because of the movements of those pieces across the board. Similarly, language also changes all the time. Language is a living thing. So, and it depends on humans. So, language is also changing at any given point of time if you look at it, it is in a process of change. However, at any given point also the arrangement is itself meaningful. If you look at a chess board while the game is on and you look at the arrangement of the uh, pieces on the chess board, it does tell you something. It tells you where exactly the uh, what, are, what is the arrangement, how who is winning or what, what stage of the game one is and so on. So, just as any at any given point of time the pieces on a chess board are meaningful by themselves even if they have come to that situation, they have come to the, uh, that particular arrangement over a period of time during the game, it is still meaningful even if you do not look at the history of it. So, even if one does not know how this arrangement came into place, even then the arrangement itself makes sense. So, that is how language also has a similar can be understood in a similar way. Even if we do not know how English came to be structured the way it is now, it is still important to look at the structure as it is now without looking at the history of it. In terms of meaning, uh, we are talking about meaning because that is what we will be ultimately following up. So, Saussure talks uh, uses the same analogy to talk about meaning as well. How, how is meaning important, is meaning important and how do we understand that. So, he says any piece of chess can be called a bishop any piece of chess, uh, any, any, we just decided it is just a matter of conventional agreement that we this particular piece comes to be called as a bishop. As we have seen before also the, this is arbitrary, the relationship between a signifier and a signified that is the name and the object, the referent and the uh, name, the relationship between these two is arbitrary that is what social basically means that there is no reason as to why uh, the bishop in the chess should be called a bishop. There is no bishopness about the piece itself. So, this is the matter of convention. Similarly, any sound can represent the idea of a tree or for that matter anything uh, uh, a computer or a screen like this behind me and so on. So, this about this particular relationship is arbitrary. So, he said that signifier and signified uh, share a relationship that is arbitrary. Now, how do we come to the meaning of what is this, what is the status of meaning of each word in a, in a uh, given sentence or in a, any, any particular formation. So, he said that words are meaningful in terms of their relationship with other words. Again he comes to the analogy of chess and he says that just as the move of one chess piece has meaning for other chess pieces, similarly language a word gets meaning from its association with other words in the same system to a large extent. So, thus it words do not function in a vacuum, they do not make sense in a vacuum, it has to be in the understood in the context of its usage with other words. So, basically language is an organized system. Language is an organized system with signifier and signified into it which has an arbitrary relationship, but the signifiers themselves are related to each other. This is the uh, gist of the matter. Then we move on to his idea of lang and parole. 
this is also a very important contribution because a lot of he gives a name to it, but um, these ideas have been there and it has been also taken up later uh, and debated uh, very significantly. So, the he, he uses the words lang and parole to refer to two different uh, aspects of language itself. So, lang refers to the rules of the total system of language, something that we have been calling the, uh, the uh, abstract representation in the brain of language, the entire system of language. What we mean by, uh, what we mean when we say that we know a language, that is a system of language. We know, if I say I know English language, it means that I know the rules that govern this language. I know how to use a, how to create grammatical sentences and I also know when somebody speaks an ungrammatical sentence that this is wrong and this is wrong because this is the um, violation of these rules and so on. So, the entire system, the rules, entire system of rules of a language that is there. Uh, in, 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 our in our understanding, in our mind is what he refers to as lang. On the other hand, parole refers to the actual use of the language, which is the speech. So, when we speak, the output that is there in that which, which is dependent on many factors is what he calls parole. After giving this uh, binary opposition of lang and parole or the two sides of the of how language is, he also mentions that it is lang which is the primary concern of linguists, because linguists must be um, talking about, must be um, bothered about, concerned with the rules that govern the language, something that is unchangeable, something that is there for all language speakers to um, know. It is, uh, parole is not an email not should not be and um, the idea that we should be studying. It cannot be primary, parole cannot be primary that is what he makes. An example that can uh, make this point clearer is that even if a parrot can speak the words of a language, we often see that many birds do mimic um, a human language. So, you can teach so to say a parrot to speak, but even if a parrot does utter the words of a language it cannot be really said to have the knowledge of the language. Even if I teach um, a pa pet parrot to speak in Hindi or in English or for it that, that matter any other language, we cannot really say that the parrot knows that language. On the other hand, if somebody knows the language, if somebody has idea about the system of the language, he or she may choose not to speak. So, you even if you have a, la if a uh, you can have a lung, but no parole, but if you have a parole you cannot be said to have a lung that is the idea. So, you might have the knowledge of the language, but you do not speak. So, there is no output that is no parole, but you still have the knowledge, but just having parole does not mean much. That is why he said that lung is the one that should be studied in detail and that is what will ultimately give us insight into the structure of languages. So, in we viewing language as a system in itself, he was the first person to really come up with this as a um, as a system, as a you know he was on, on his way to establish language studies, linguistics as a discipline in itself as a as an important domain to, um, uh, to, to investigate. So, in viewing language as a system in itself that to a cognitive system, because he said that this is uh, this is internal, the lung is internal, it is there in the brain and uh, we already have this knowledge. If you have a, if you know a language, you have the lung inside in, inside of your mind. So, he basically places language as a cognitive system within one's mind that is there within one's mind. So, as in that way Saussure is always um, often understood as a precursor to modern linguistic theories. Um, this is something that we already know, but in his time this was um, this was a major uh, standpoint to take because language was considered uh, not so much of a mental state and so much of you know the cognitivism was still not uh, fashionable. So, that is why uh, Saussure is understood to be a precursor to today's mentalistic approach to language studies. The next um, scholar, a towering figure that we will talk about, um, without whom any study of linguistics will be um, will not be complete is Leonard Bloomfield. Bloomfield was also a structuralist and he is 
he was uh, he brought structuralism to america he is an american linguist and he is credited with the development of formal methods and procedures to study languages so he believed that language structure should be studied of course and they should be studied in a proper way because of uh, and to do that he he devised methods notational systems he he devised uh, for studies of language how to really create formal methods that is what I, where his uh, major contribution lies and procedures. So, analyzing language needs some kind of a structured approach, it needs some kind of a scientific method. This is what Bloomfield brought into it. He studied a lot of languages, uh, many of them uh, were con considered exotic languages at that time and uh, remember the colonial hangover. So, these are these were understood to be uh, exotic from their perspective from the western perspective. So, Tagalog in Philippines and um, Malayo Polynesian and many other languages that he studied and he used his uh, methods his scientific method to analyze and describe these languages using these methods and he became a very very important figure uh, the most probably the most looming figure in linguistics in America in his time. He was a behaviorist, uh, he came under the influence of um, A. P. Wise in Ohio, Ohio and he gradually became a total behaviorist towards um, in a later in the later days. So, as a result of which he uh, completely rejected the psychological features of language. So, he did not consider it a uh, mental um, state so to say and he considered it entirely a physical phenomenon something that uh, we have something that we see. So, the tangible evidence the tangible system that we see and those outputs that can be uh, studied explained through rules and thus yield some amount of prediction only those aspects need to be studied as far as uh, Bloomfield is concerned. So, meaning was not really given much importance to uh, uh, in, in Bloomfield study though he is credited with uh, uh, with, uh, with refining the structure of um, analysis refining the methods of analysis of languages in terms of structure however, meaning did not was not uh, his, fa his uh, favorite topic. Now, we come to another very important strand uh, in this entire um, uh, puzzle is Franz Boa. Franz Boa worked on uh, various um, uh, American Native American languages of that time and that brought as I uh, previously mentioned that in, in the exposure to various uh, languages that, they, that the western world did not previously know gave a rise to a lot of you know gave that opened the floodgate literally of studying the exotic languages. So, Franz Boa was also among them. However, he, he took a completely different turn he established a tradition in the within the study of language in America that concentrated on the links between language and culture. However, unlike his predecessors he did not link this relationship between language and culture from hierarchical perspectives. The others before him did give a lot of importance to this hierarchy where western, uh, where, where western languages were considered to be at the pinnacle of civilization and finery and so on. He had a strong departure from that standpoint and in his study of uh, native American languages he argued very strongly against close relationship between race and language a standpoint that was quite favor favorable at that time. He said that it is this language this uh, language one particular language probably has this kind of structures which are different from the languages that we speak does not mean that this language is deficient in some sense that was primarily the standpoint. So, languages in his descriptive studies of various um, native American languages he primarily tried to show that these languages have this kind of structures and this is related to this particular community that is all there is no value judgment there. So, different languages have different structures different ways of expressing the same thing and this is uh, this is just a matter of differences not a matter of um, quality in some sense this is just a difference plain and simple. Edward uh, Sape his student uh, carried this idea on and um, later on he, he is uh, Sapir is the one part one half of the Sapir of uh, duo. So, in his uh, work language culture interrelationship grow, grew uh, a lot further um, after, after he was influenced by Franz Boa and linguistic differences and cultural differences he looked at from a very different standpoint. 
just like Boa, he also carried this thought over that linguistic and cultural differences probably have something uh, that, that can tell us about the world, how different uh, points of view are there, different points of view as enshrined in language structure. So, because some languages have different ways of expressing the same thing like the sense of time and space and relationships and so on that the world view basically that probably tells us something about the relativity aspect. So, that is where we will uh, move uh, that is what Edward Said and uh, Benjamin Lee Wolf are credited with the relativism the idea of relativity linguistic relativity. So, languages uh, are important to understand how different people are uh, how different world views are there in different cultural systems. So, his major contribution again he was in terms of um, the studies on the indigenous languages of the Americas. So, he studied a lot of them and he also um, um, of course, he did many other things apart from his language culture um, relationship studies. He also developed the concept of phoneme and he was also a torch bearer of Yiddish language studies in the US. He was uh, he, he spoke English as his first language and he, devil, he did a lot of um, important works on that so given a uh, structural description and so on. However, uh, since we are talking about meaning here, he did not ignore meaning in the lang in language. In fact, that is where his whole uh, contribution, a lot of his contribution actually lies. He mentioned in his book that human thinking is structured by the language one uses. It is a very strong claim to make. He's, he showed that because he showed through his study on different indigenous languages that they are structured differently. In fact, as a result of which he says, in fact, they look at the world also differently. So, the gradual next step that he took was to say that the language that you speak basically colors the way you look at the world. So, this is um, and I quote language habits of our community predispose certain choices of interpretation. So, the language that you uh, speak makes you look at the world in a particular way. This was the um, claim that he made in his, um, in his uh, book language and introduction to the study of speech 1921. Now, we will move on to Benjamin Lee Worf, uh, his, uh, his student Benjamin Lee Worf was basically a fire safety engineer uh, by profession, but he also studied um, Native American languages to a great extent and he developed Sapir's ideas further and opined that along with language our basic uh, notions may also be influenced by along with uh, um, language our basic notions will also can also be um, influenced by language language shapes conceptualization. He says that language may actually create conceptualization, it may not just color, but it creates a, our conceptualization. This particular stand of um, that has been espoused by both Sapir and Worf and as a result of which, which it is called sapir Worf hypothesis, which is um, the other name for it is linguistic relativity. So, what is linguistic relativity? It is entirely based on the meaning aspect of language. So, the way a language is structured, the way it conveys the meaning about a particular aspect of the world basically structures the way we look at the world as well. So, if your language has many um, different ways of looking at a particular object, probably it looks at it, it makes you um, more adept at understanding that concept at a finer aspect if as opposed to a language that does not have so many uh, different ways of looking at it structurally speaking. So, they had a very, very strong claim to make and linguistic relativity uh, was quite popular for some time and um, it, um, it actually made very important claims. So, he studied um, again many in a, um, Native American languages, Hopi in the, is the famous case. In fact, the, the case of time in Hopi is a famous one. So, notions of space, time, matter can differ. He says something as basic. So, it is not only you know, on the surface that you talk differently about certain things, but even your primary notions about basic human cognition, basic human understanding about things like space, time and so on might also change depending on the language that you speak. Hopi was a language that was given as an example and the concept of uh, time in Hopi um, due to brevity of time we cannot really go into the details of the language. Uh, but uh, yeah, that is, but based, uh, based on that language uh, studies, he made this very strong claim. Another important contribution of uh, Worf is on the, uh, in the case of habitual use. So, if you use a language, if you use certain structure in a language, it, it 
colors, it changes you the way habitually you look at a particular thing that it denotes. The very famous example of this was that understanding of full versus empty gasoline drums. So, as you know, Worf um, was a fire safety engineer, he worked for an insurance company. So, during one of his visits to a particular um, facility, one particular storehouse or somewhere. Uh, so, he went there and he saw that you know the full gas drums of gasoline were placed in one room, the other room had empty gasoline drums. Now, the empty gasoline drums actually have the vapor, gasoline vapor in that which makes them far more uh, flammable as opposed to the uh, 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 full, full um, uh, drums. However, he saw a lot of workers sitting in that room and smoking. And when he asked how can they smoke in the room with the gasoline drums, they said it is empty. Now, he knows as, a, as an engineer that this is a very, very, um, this can be extremely dangerous. In fact, the empty gasoline drums are far more dangerous than the uh, full gasoline drums, but because it is called empty, the workers normally, the people who are using that language do not take them as seriously. So, they are not taken as a threat. Um, at all. So, this is an example he gave to show that how the use of language, the structure of language also colors our habitual thought process. So, in many ways uh, they actually uh, were the pioneers to study language, culture and cognition. This is um, a statement he makes and I quote, we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native languages. Thus, the work of Sapir and Worf contributed to the understanding of the relationship between language, culture and cognition to a large extent. However, all these were, were um, descriptive studies, they, these were speculative and descriptive to a large extent and there was, um, there was hardly any experimental work that uh, backed up their, com that their uh, claims. By 1960s, Sapir Wav hypothesis however, was very harshly critiqued and it went out of fashion. If you remember, we talked about the cognitive revolution that was taking place in 19, the, the ground was already prepared in the 40s and 40s, 50s and 60s saw a lot of activities and a lot of new, um, you know, new disciplines came into being, a lot of new agent uh, work was going on, lot of new findings, empirical data available, all that made Sapir Wav hypothesis go completely out of fashion and cognitive universalism was more uh, important was the uh, flavor of the season so to say. So, it completely disagreed with the question of relativity. Cognitive universalism basically talks about the centrality, the, uh, the universality of the central mental mechanism of the human mind. So, you cannot really um, uh, as a result of which it did not find much support for relativity hypothesis. So, in the late 20th century however, there was a resurgence of interest in this in their work, uh, in, in their work and it is called neo warfism. A lot of new um, interest has been generated and with the help of empirical research, with the help of latest technology, some researchers are looking at those questions yet again. But we will discuss this during the, uh, during the course of course, many of these will be discussed. Then during 1950s, 60s uh, cognitive revolution took place, behaviorism came under attack as we have discussed before. Behaviorism for language basically refers to the aspect that language is learned behavior, it is out there in the society, you know it is there in the, it is a stimulus response kind of a system. So, that was also attacked in terms of um, language studies, it was most heavily, most famous attack on it came from Chomsky, Noam Chomsky. And then of course, the advances in allied fields, all these uh, relate to the serious challenges to structuralism in linguistic studies. So much so that even uh, well known structuralists like Charles Hockett and Zelig Harris also started bringing changes to the way they looked at language studies. So, Hockett agreed that it is not possible to have an entirely objective analysis and description of language, because the descriptivists, the structuralists were looking at language objectively, only the structure as it is. But Hockett um, towards the towards um, later pe period of time agreed that probably some amount of empathy, he called it empathy by the researcher was always put in the analysis of the uh, structure. So, it is not probably entirely objective. So, descriptive studies uh, structuralism was getting a uh, question from the uh, practitioners of the field themselves. Similarly, Zelig Harris also um, started bringing in transformation rules 
while describing the syntactic uh, system in a language. So, he, he brought he was though he was working still within the descriptive framework, he tried to bring in transformation rules to organize the data in a better way. But he does not of course, uh, try to create one single abstract rule that applies to all languages which of course, his student um, takes it forward. So, that is where we come to Chomsky. Noam Chomsky is probably the most well known linguist all over for of all times, um, not only in terms of the powerful claims he makes, but also in terms of the contribution he has held had to myriad disciplines, not only linguistics, but he has his contribution was felt among various disciplines of the time. So, his uh, primary uh, contribution of Chomsky was as I said, he attacked behaviorism very strongly giving very strong arguments against it and uh, we can um, we can actually uh, talk about his contribution only in terms of two, three uh, things here. So, mentalism, he says that language is something that is not out there, it is not in the environment that you teach somebody, students do not need to be taught language so to say children do not need to be taught language, language is something that we are born with, it is hardwired into our brain. So, it is something that is innate. So, innateness hypothesis is Chomsky's biggest contribution to the study of languages. He says that every, every human being by virtue of being a human is born with a system which initially called LAD language acquisition device which he later called universal grammar. So, there is an abstract, there is a system of abstract rules that applies to languages which is something that everybody or all humans are born with. So, this is innate, innate capacity in us and this is something that you cannot probably teach. This, this idea he carried forward with the help of a uh, very strong argument of poverty of stimulus. He says that every human is capable of generating an infathomable number of sentences in his during his lifetime, sentences and structure that he has never ever heard. So, if language was a power uh, language was a stimulus response system, then stimulus and response should be similar, they should be equal at least equivalent, but this is not the case. You cannot have learned all the sentences that, that you um, that you generate in your lifetime. So, that poverty in terms of stimulus is something that proves that we are capable of creating sentences based on the rules. Because we have those rules in our head, we are able to create those uh, sentences using the same rules. We can create multiple permutations and computations um, on those uh, same set of um, inputs that we have, the words that we have and so on. So, innateness on the one hand is his primary contribution and on the other hand he focuses his studies mostly on um, syntax. So, his idea like we have seen uh, how la language was understood as a logical, uh, if you look at language as logical language, then it also has you know serious repercussions for the idea of logic, for the idea of mathematics and so on. Similarly, Chomsky also takes the uh, similar kind of uh, stand and he says that syntax is most important thing to study, how the sentence structures are created, how they are transformed, what are the rules that govern them, so on and so forth. Um, he does not give much extra importance to meaning. Of course, Chomsky is one, um, one figure who changes, who has made um, uh, revisions to his own theory over a period of time, so many revisions and he has taken to a uh, later time, he has included semantics to a some to some extent. But by and large, he means he, he looks at syntax as the central aspect of language, meaning is not so very important. The most um, uh, important uh, sentence that he has, uh, you know, among many, he has given out to, to make this point is that colorless green ideas sleep furiously, the which all of you are of, of course aware of. So, the, even if a sentence as meaningless as this can still be understood, so to say, by the native speakers of English as having some kind of a meaning. So, that is where he really makes a point that it is the because it is structured properly, because it is not violating any of the syntactic rules of the language, it is a perfect language. So, grammaticality, the, uh, the syntactic uh, you know, grammaticality in terms of syntactic formations is what is paramount, meaning is not so important. So, as a result of which we see that science uh, then um, during the emergence of cognitive science as a discipline, Tomsky was working on language. So, he was trying to uh, position lang linguistics, position language studies uh, firmly as a scientific endeavor. 
So, Saussure, if Saussure and Bloomfield and others um, were are credited with making linguistics as a serious subject to look at, serious um, endeavor to uh, pursue, if language uh, they, they brought language to the center point uh, to the focal point of uh, studies uh, on its own right, in its own right, on its own ground. Chomsky, on the other hand, is credited with aligning the same with science science as in the hard sciences like physics, like mathematics and so on. In fact, often he, he aligns uh, linguistics with mathematics, though of course, he has faced a lot of criticism because of this from uh, various standpoints. However, his, uh, his, his contribution cannot ever be denied. So, one of the central points of attack on uh, critique on uh, Chomsky and paradigm is that it concerns itself more with theory than with understanding language. So, now till now we have seen that language has been seen from various standpoints before Chomsky it was the you uh, it was the language as it is like the structure of language. With Chomsky we go into the theory of how it actually is. So, the mental aspect of it the way it is in built into our system. So, basically while trying to theorize about language about some rules that are that govern it we are going away from the understanding aspect of language. So, basically from the nature of language to the theory of language compromises certain aspects which are inherent to something as human as language. That is the first critique of that is in, for, in, uh, in fact, the most important um, criticism that Chomsky faced. So, in order to establish linguistics as a science efforts were made to make it a system that is independent of context and users. because the abstract aspect remember lang that is the abstract set of rules that human languages have that knowledge of which every human has is that it should be understood in terms of its um, features in terms of the rules in terms of the permutations and combinations the way it really functions and as a result of which it should not be dependent on contexts and users because the moment you bring it down to contexts and users there are compromises to be had. So, it is like physics or mathematics for example, those rules of physics do not change if it is applied to a different context similarly language. So, that is the that was the ambition of uh, Chomsky, Chomsky and paradigm to make it a total science and as a result of which context and users were completely ignored to a large extent. This was one very simple uh, major critic. Second was the syntax centric framework entire focus was on syntactic um, formations, syntactic rules and so on as a result of which meaning was compromised. And um, there is a lot of criticism that Chomsky faced because of this, because without meaning language has um, very, very, very limited use. If you do not have uh, meaning incorporated, then there is no point in talking. Another thing, another, another important aspect on which the criticism came in is modularity. This is actually, this actually draws from the uh, scientific aspect of language, where he takes language as a, as a field in itself and which should be devoid of contexts and devoid of any other functions. So, language is independent of all other mental faculties, a very serious claim to make, but Chomsky and paradigm does make that claim that it is in that is it is complete in itself it does not depend on other mental faculties as it, as it does not depend on context and users. So, language however, the, the developments after 1950s from various disciplines like neuroscience like psychology and many other disciplines that show that language use actually involves processing of many aspects of knowledge, experience, beliefs and so on and without which language will not be a viable option for communication at all. It cannot be a mathematical symbol, it cannot be a mathematical formula that we use all the time. It has, it has you know it imbibes belief system, it imbibes knowledge of the world, it imbibes experiences and so on. If we do not use them, then it is not a viable option for communication. Because communication refers to conveying these aspects of meaning through a rule based string of sounds. So, what we ultimately have is an output that is rule based of course, there are grammatical rules, but what it conveys is of course, also very, very important and what it conveys is those understandings, those knowledge system, belief, experiences and so on. Hence, modularity aspect has been very severely uh, criticized. The as a result of the later findings um, uh, from the different, different disciplines is um, now the understanding about language is that language is part of the general cognitive faculty of the human brain. 
human brain uh, is capable of uh, carrying out various kinds of um, uh, various kinds of uh, actions like attention like executive control like many other things like that similarly language is just another general purpose cognitive mechanism and like any mechanism it also depends on a cooperation across various various uh, different kinds of different types of mental faculty it cannot be a modular um, it cannot be um, it cannot be insulated from other mental faculties so language functions as a result are not dissociated from other mental functions neuroscience psycholinguistics cognitive psychology and um, this kind of disciplines have given us enough data enough empirical evidence to take this as a starting point that language functions are actually in uh, in, in a very strong relationship with many other mental faculties. In fact, this is what we will be exploring in this course through various um, sub, sub, sub domains. And brain areas responding to executive functions have been found to be associated with language related task as well. So, you know firmly uh, this is just one example of how language uh, function, language use is uh, dependent on other mental functions. Similarly, findings from visual world studies have strongly put forward evidence that language and attentional mechanisms are intrinsically related. We will build up on these um, later on uh, in, in, the, in the area of attention and executive control. Similarly, the research on theory of mind and its use uh, and its use in atypical children is something we will explore in the language learning and how theory of mind, the development of theory of mind in atypical children is also um, has something to do with the language use and language exposure and so on. So, what do all these things mean? It means that language uh, cannot and does not function in a vacuum. We have till now the studies that we have uh, focused on basically bring us this primary understanding that language is not working in isolation. It works with in relation to other various other kinds of uh, mental mechanisms. So, understanding any facet of language either processing or learning language uh, is not again an unitary thing it is not a monolith it has many facets. So, learning language, teaching language, processing language you know all these um, are take into account a plethora of non-linguistic factors which have nothing to do with linguistics which have nothing to do with language per se, but it has done to, has to do with everything human. Then we can move on to the understanding of mind. We have already talked about cognition and in terms of brain as in terms of thought. So, we will um, just see uh, just uh, talk about the faculties of mind. So, mind again is not unitary, mind is um, a kind of understood always to be composed of various functions. So, from the very beginning of the study of mind it has been understood to be having separate um, domains of understanding. So, these are um, called the faculties of mind. So, for example, to start with reason, thought, you know morality, emotion, willing, volition, language etcetera are part of mind. And reality as we have seen already this is um, something we have already covered, but we just uh, uh, talk briefly about it. Reality and its relation to the mind again we talk about most part of knowledge. Remember we talked about knowledge, what is knowledge? Knowledge refers to the reality, the truth as it is in the world. So, reality also refers to the reality of the world, the, the idea of the world. Now, here is where the debate is and does the world come in a structured form or it does come in a unstructured form. If it is if it is in a structured form already that means, it already exists without any, uh, any, any tempering by the human mind. It is independent of the human mind and its manipulations. But on the other side the idea is that reality is really unstructured, it is just a mass that grains structure through the human beings, human beings interference. The cognitive processes of the human mind create what reality is for us, it is not a pre given uh, uh, thing that is already out there. So, mind and body relationship we have already seen in terms of Descartes. So, there is a uh, mind is transcendent, it is independent of the body and it is abstract and goes beyond the body. On the other hand mind the understanding of embodied cognition talks about mind that is based on the body. So, we have already seen this before. So, as a result of which the current status of language studies in terms of uh, the in terms of based on the empirical evidence that we already have is that language is a higher order mental function which works in tandem with other mental faculties. So, 
Along with um, uh, that, languages relation with context also starts to get in, um, inspected. So, not only in the insight, not only in terms of the brain and mind, language works in relationship with other mental faculties, but it also interacts outside the human brain. So, that is there are two different worlds that are interacting, the world inside of us and the world outside. So, inside there is lot of cooperation between language uh, faculty and the other mental faculties and the same brain also interacts with the world, the, the felt experiences, the human experiences and the context and the user and so on and so forth and that all that information is also incorporated in the language structure and use and understanding and communication. So, this is ultimately what language is all about and it is very difficult to separate language from all these aspects and that is exactly how we will look at language in this course. So, but that does not mean that the abstract rule based um, uh, representation of language in the human brain is negated in any way. So, we can safely say even though the debate is still uh, on that is the last word is not yet out. So, debate between formal language and everyday language is far from over, uh, but we can agree and uh, disagree at the same time. We can agree that there is a rule based uh, which is beyond um, of course, beyond debate that there is a there is a, um, a set of rules that operate at a very higher level at an abstract level that uh, creates uh, creates all the grammatical sentences in a language and that is how uh, language remains uh, understandable. Uh, but at the same time language is also used by humans in real context. So, in this course we will uh, I hope after this um, brief introduction over three parts um, we have seen that we have seen both sides of the story. However, in this course um, we will be looking at language human language as it is used in the real context and how it really um, and what are the interesting most interesting aspects of it. So, for doing that we will start with um, our point of departure will be meaning construction and its dynamics. So, intensive study of cognition that lies behind language used is will and that also goes beyond it. It is when we speak, when we use language, when we process language in terms of either speaking or understanding, there is a lot that is going on behind the scene, which is basically uh, which is called the backstage cognition and it uh, includes a lot of a plethora of mental activities and that is what is at the uh, that is what also leads to meaning construction, meaning the dynamics of meaning generation, meaning construction and conceptualization, all these are things that we will look at. So, language not only helps uh, you know creating this, but also reflects it. A language activity draws unconsciously as I just said on a vast um, amount of cognitive resource like referring to be different models, set up multiple connections. Um, coordinate large um, in, uh, amount of information, engage in creative mapping and transfer and elaboration and so on and so forth. So, this is basically what uh, is referred to as backstage cognition in literature and um, all that information as we speak is ultimately you know it is optimized in language structure. So, a lot of information is given out dependent on these kind of you know uh, uh, mappings like uh, viewpoints, reference, figure ground mapping and then trajectory um, uh, landmark and trajectory mapping and metaphors and metonymy and so on and so forth ultimately gives rise to the brevity that we see in language. We can say a lot with very few uh, words with it is a very, very cleverly created structure that is not something that we create all, all the time. Of course, that also happens individual creativity is also visible sometimes, but as a, a every language has its own way of um, making those connections across domains and making various kinds of projections, various kinds of you know backstage cognition that reflects through language is what we will uh, we are more interested in. So, this is um, these are some of the things that uh, through which we will look at this phenomena of language interacting with other mental faculty. So, framing prototype structure, pragmatic functions so on and so forth. It, to do this there is a new uh, relatively new field of linguistics which uh, is called the cognitive linguistics and this is the domain that we will start our journey with. Uh, this is a the relatively uh, new field uh, it started it, it came into existence after the cognitive revolution and it owes its um, origin to many uh, uh, names like George Lekoff and others. So, this takes this discipline this particular standpoint takes the um, theoretical 
uh, standpoint that syntactic validity of utterances cannot be judged without referring to non-linguistic concepts. A sentence is um, can be judged in terms of its meaning, in terms of what it conveys that is what he says. So, description of linguistic structures needs to take into account aspects of uh, general cognition like um, how meaning is construed. The same sentence can mean different things in a in different contexts. So, it is very uh, it is very um, it is it is very humid today man can mean different things in different contexts it, it, whether it is in India or it is in a in, in a different country now uh, where generally humidity is not the general feature of course, the meaning is different it can even have some speech act um, uh, related to it. So, meaning cannot be discounted like uh, like Chomsky and in like it, it is done in Chomsky and paradigm. So, linguistics basically the understanding of grammar the understanding of language structure is based on the conceptualization and human experience that is the starting point of cognitive linguistics. So, meaning is said to reside in conceptualization. So, conceptualization is a mental process that is not linguistic in nature that is a mental primary mental function which to which language is related and meaning is basically created out of that process. So, grammar is not seen as autonomous grammar, grammar cannot be seen as an autonomous uh, entity and it takes meaning as a central um, issue in human language study and that is how it offers this domain offers an unified account of meaning in language um, and uh, by a while accounting for various social and cultural phenomena. So, as a result of which it does not believe this, this discipline does not believe this uh, sub discipline of language does not believe that reality is already structured it is um, it depends a lot on the language it depends on the various other non linguistic factors. So, language uh, the reality is um, unstructured. So, however, it, it is not entirely subjective there are universals as well and which is which arises from the fact that uh, we have similar bodies and brains and that we inhibit similar kinds of environments and that we communicate with each other. So, there are of course, a lot of universality to it however, this discipline also takes into account the, um, the other as other side of the story the, the interaction between different kinds of uh, contexts. Uh, so, it, it is this is uh, seriously dependent on the embodied uh, understanding of language. Um, so, this is the linguistics aspect lingu how linguistics have been um, have been structured through centuries through a uh, couple of centuries and how to, uh, over a period of time theoretical standpoints have changed and where we are today in terms of cognitive linguistics. So, we will start the first um, uh, the module 2 second first lecture of module 2 with uh, uh, with cognitive linguistics and however, it is um, also important to look at the psychological um, side of it. So, how that the role of cognitive psychology psychology and cognitive psychology together on lang understanding language has also been extremely important, but we will discuss it in during the course not in the introduction it will be discussed more in detail later. Here are some references that are useful to understand this particular um, aspect and so here we complete the module 1 first module in three parts that uh, that was designed to give a brief background of the uh, course that we will be eventually looking at through different um, points of departure. Thank you and we will move on to the next module.